Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, before we get started, I want to do a little housekeeping. Um, make sure to silence your phones, put them on do not disturb, your computers, your watches, any small children you've brought with you. Um, we don't want them going off in the middle of presentation. You don't want any unwanted attention. So, uh, to do that now, uh, if you have questions, uh, just write it down, make a note. Uh, well, we should have a few minutes at the end to answer questions about things I talk about today. And of course, I'm going to be here for the next two days, so you can uh, certainly catch me anytime. And as always, as you can tell, we're recording these sessions. We'll be recording all of the sessions. They'll be available to all of you. And uh, I want to encourage you to post on social media. If you're going to do that, use the hashtag XDC2022. Now, I want to mention our MVPs. Um, they do a terrific job. They give us lots of feedback. They communicate with the community, of course. And I really appreciate the job they're doing. So I want to thank all of them, Anthony, Christian, Jeremy, Kim, uh, Martin, and Wayne. And uh, three of them are here, Christian, Jeremy, and Kim. So make sure you take a moment to uh, meet them. And of course, the Zojo team is here as well. Uh, in case you don't know what we look like, <laughs> there we are with our names. Jason's not here. He had a family emergency at the last second, so he was not able to attend, but he told me to tell you to say hello. Oh, there they are. Sorry. Yeah. So, you know, coming to these events and doing these events is something that we really, really enjoy. I mean, you know, the Internet's great and Zoom is great and all that stuff, but meeting in person is uh, uh, much, much nicer. So. Now, <clears throat> when the pandemic started, a lot of companies went to online events. We did an online event, and I'm sure that many companies will continue to do on online events in the future. They're, they're certainly more convenient, but it's not quite the same <clears throat> as doing something in person. So the feedback we got from the community was everybody wanted an in-person event, but a lot of people were not quite ready to travel. So I appreciate you guys you know, braving the airports and all of that to, to get here. Uh, we planned for this to be a small event, but the, there's a real benefit to the size of this event because we get to interact with all of you. And when we have bigger events, it's a lot more difficult, but at a small event like this, uh, it's a lot easier. So that's, that's really great. So don't be shy about, you know, sitting down with any of us and talking about some thing you're, issue you're having or feature you want or, you know, whatever it is. Uh, don't be shy about that at all. This is also our first uh, in-person event as a company in, since the pandemic started. In fact, uh, Ricardo back there, we were meeting him for the first time. You know, we've seen him on Zoom, but this is our first time meeting him in person. So <clears throat> now we've got a full day of sessions today. We have a half day tomorrow. And we've got some great uh, afternoon activities tomorrow as well. And the feedback we got from all of you is that you like the sessions, but equally important are the social activities and opportunities to, uh, to chat and stuff. So we really optimized around that this time, which I think is going to be really great. So how long has it been uh, since we got together? It feels like forever. So I did some math. And it's been, yeah, since Miami, it's been 3.38 years. And as developers, we love to geek out on data. So it's been 40 months. Uh, it's been uh, 176 weeks. Uh, it's been 1,237 days, which is 29,688 seconds. That's a long time. Or sorry, hours, hours. Yeah, it's over 1.7 million minutes or over 106 million seconds. So when you say anything over 100 million, is a, that's a big number, right? So long time. It's been a really, really long time. So what's happened since that? Since then, well, we had that pandemic thing happen, right? <laughs> we've all been going through that, and uh, but besides that, we've been adding a lot of features to the product, and I want to mention just a few of them, most notable ones in reverse chronological order, just to make it interesting. So we recently added Windows on ARM, so you can build applications that run on ARM-based uh, laptops and tablets uh, that run Windows. And we made the conversion from feedback to issues. 
for tracking bugs and feature requests. Now, initially that was a difficult decision, uh, but you know, one of the ways that we can build such a broad product and such a large product as Zojo with such a small team is by being as efficient as possible. And boy, efficiency is a word that we use a lot at Zojo and we get more and more efficient in every part of the business uh, as years go by. And so this really made a lot of sense uh, to, to make our, ourselves a little more efficient in terms of you know, not having to, not having to um, maintain an application just for doing this. Uh, issues is great. You guys have given us a lot of great feedback about it. Uh, it really seems like it was the right choice, so we're pretty happy about that. I, I love being able to look at uh, cases on my phone, for example, which is something I couldn't do before. We moved our documentation to a new platform. That was a huge job, and I'm gonna be talking about this more in my session called Building uh, database pro or Data Processing Tools. We added on-device debugging for iOS, and you know, if you've built iOS apps, you know that the simulator is, you know, it's pretty good, but there are certain things you just can't do in the simulator, uh, or are inconvenient to do, and being able to debug on-device is very, very handy. We added um, multi-core support with the worker class. Uh, I think we made it about as easy as you can make it to support multiple cores. Uh, I know when, when multiple core processors first came along, uh, the request we got was, well, just make it multi-core. <laughs> and it doesn't quite work that way. Yeah, not quite. But the worker class makes it really simple. In fact, when we finally got it implemented, I was surprised at how easy it is to use, which is really, really great. We added Apple Silicon support, and we actually shipped our Apple Silicon support just two weeks after Apple shipped their first Apple Silicon-based Macs. Now, in the early days, we could build uh, Mac apps from Windows and Linux, and then Apple made a bunch of changes which made that impossible. Uh, we moved to LLVM, and over time, the LLVM team uh, made changes to their linker so that we could support building Mac apps on Windows and Linux again, which is really, really great. PDF generation, you can now build PDF documents uh, in Zojo, and we have a <clears throat> half dozen classes for doing that. You, if you haven't tried this, you can build just about any kind of app, uh, or document, rather. And you can do things in PDF documents I didn't even think PDF documents could even do, I mean, as I've been studying the classes. They're much more uh, powerful than I thought. You know, I thought they're just for providing a document in uh, digital form. They're, you can do much more than that. We added a remote notification service for Zojo Cloud. Now, if you've never had to do this, if you're gonna send remote notifications, like you know, if you have an app that uh, relies on some internet service and it needs to notify you of things, that's a remote notification. Um, these, there are services out there that do remote notifications, and it, that seems like it should be an easy thing to set up, but it turns out they're really complicated. I don't know why, but they're very, very complicated to set up. On Zojo Cloud, we've made it seamless. I mean, it's check a box and you're done. It's, it's extremely easy. So if you ever need remote notification, this is a great way to go and you'll be spoiled rotten. In fact, I almost urge you to go look at the other services first because you'll appreciate how easy it is on Zojo Cloud once you do that. Now, right now we support them for iOS, but we're gonna be expanding support for remote notifications to other platforms over time. We added the mobile framework, so you can write code for both iOS and Android. We added the web framework, web framework two. There's a lot of stuff since <laughs> three years ago. We added plugin support for iOS, because initially we didn't have that. Yay, <laughs> Christian's happy about that. And we added API two since the last conference. That's how long it's been, right? It was after our last conference in Miami that we added API 2. That really gives you a, a sense for how long it's been since we got together last. Now, in terms of some statistics for our release notes, we made 286 changes over that time, uh, 302 new features, and 1,405 bug fixes. And that's not counting the bug fixes we did during the bug bash, because that, those haven't shipped yet, right? That's, that's our three. And we've added two new team members since that last conference. Uh, Javier Menendez, where's Javier? 
in the back, okay. We've actually been working with Javier for a long time, uh, but was, it was all strictly Spanish marketing, and he has since joined us uh, on the engineering team. So, in fact, he's responsible for the uh, PDF classes, amongst a lot of other things, so if you have PDF questions, he's your man. And Ricardo Cruz is the newest member of our team. He's r responsible for the web framework. Uh, he started in March, yep. and boy, I mean, he got off the, he got off and running very, very quickly. We're very, very happy because the web framework, as you guys know, is enormous, and he just dived right in. This is the advantage that we have when we hire users. It's, it's always been more successful for us to hire users, and that's just worked out extremely well. Okay, so in Miami, we showed you a basically a prototype that we had working at that point of Android, and we could just put controls on the screen, and that was it. We couldn't even compile code. Uh, at that point, we had three different plans for compiling code. We ultimately went with plan B, so always have a backup, right? And uh, at this point, we're feature complete for the first release, and all we're doing is fixing bugs, so we're, we've made a lot of progress. And Travis is going to be doing a session at 2 o'clock today <coughs> on Android. Now, you know, we had the bug bash in August, and that was a whole lot of fun. Uh, we really appreciate everybody participating in that. Uh, our focus for this was a little different than we typically do for uh, fixing bugs. Typically, we're looking at overall impact the overall impact surface when we're fixing bugs. So something that impacts everybody and in a way that they can't work around, that's the kind of thing we're you know, gonna focus on uh, first. That, that'll get the highest priority. Then it'll be things with high impact that affect a lot of users, you know, the upper right quadrant. You've all seen quadrant graphs, right? And we realize though that there are those cases where it's, uh, it doesn't affect a lot of people, it might only affect one person, but it's, impossible for them to work around, it's stopping them from being able to add a feature to their product. And we wanted, those kind of things under the normal criteria would never bubble to the top. But they're still painful. So we decided that's where we were gonna focus, so the sort of lower right quadrant for the bug bash. Um, and that went really well. We fixed exactly 100 bugs. <laughs> As it was coming to a close, Dana was, we're 93, 94, 95, she's counting down, hopefully we're gonna, or counting up rather, hopefully we're gonna get to 100, and we did, exactly 100. Uh, Paul fixed the two oldest bugs, uh, they both were nine years old. Uh, one was the bug where uppercase, title case, and lowercase weren't handling non-Roman characters properly. Uh, that was one, and then the other had to do with um, uh, nav the navigator dragging items, reordering items in the navigator. And one of our engineers fixed 34% of all the bugs that were fixed during the bug bash. And so the winner <laughs> is William. 34% all by himself. Yeah. That's, a, that's an impressive statistic. <laughs> well, <laughs> So one interesting statistic from the bug bash we found is that 50% of the issues that were nominated had, were issues that had been created in the last 90 days. Now, this is understandable because things that are happening right now are things you care about most, right? This is just part of human nature. The closer proximity anything is, the more important it becomes. So that, that was an interesting statistic. But another nice thing about the bug bash is that it gave our engineering team more opportunity to work in parts of the, of the source code that they don't normally work in. So it really creates great comfort you know, in other parts of the software that you're just not familiar with. Um, it also means we have greater code coverage, you know, or, or to say a different way, engineering coverage over the code. Because more people are familiar with more parts of it. For example, uh, now more than half the engineering team has worked on the compiler, right? So we have plenty of people who can do compiler work when we need it, which is really great. We felt like the bug bash went super, you know, just it was super. It went really, really well. Uh, we we're really happy with the results. And uh, we want to make sure that those kind of issues get addressed. We don't want this to be a once every few years sort of thing. So what we're gonna be doing is spreading this out a bit so that in each release cycle, we'll have a two-week period 
where we're looking for these kind of cases. So if you have something that's really important to you personally, but it doesn't have a lot of people signed on to that issue, what you want to do is obviously create an issue, and then there's a, a thumbs up button in issues. You're going to want to click that button because that's what we're going to be looking for. That's how we'll tell that the case is a high priority for you. If it's not a high priority, if it's just something you want to report, you don't need to do that. But, but if it is a high priority for you, maybe there's no work around, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Yeah, there's the thumbs up. <laughs> okay. We're still doing a lot of automated testing, continuing to improve that. We do full builds of Zojo two to five times a week with our automated build process. We don't obviously ship all those for pre-release testing, but every time we do a build, the build system runs through our entire test suite. <clears throat> we have 346 uh, tests for Android, and you can see them running in the Android simulator. They, they all pass, which is great. Thank you, Paul <laughs> and Travis. We have over 400 compiler tests. Now the compiler doesn't change as often, so you won't see that number change a lot. That's just a part of the product that doesn't need to change very often, but as it does, more, there are more tests get added. So we have over 2,500 total tests, and as our code base grows, the number of automated tests just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So this really helps us catch a lot of things before it ever even goes out to pre-release testing. All right, How, what's been going on in the community over the last three plus years? Well, <clears throat> we, as you probably know, we have the Made with Zojo Showcase. It's got over 100 apps in it now. But I want to point out that, just like in the software industry in general, way, way, way more apps are built for internal purposes at companies, right? It's only, a, even though the app stores all have, you know, millions of apps or whatever, uh, it's, that's only a tiny fraction of the total software that's created, right? So, um, but anyway, we have over 100 apps now, and I just want to show a couple real quick. Uh, this is Hexfiller. It's a mobile app. It's a pattern recognition game uh, from Gold Creek. I, I need to show this to my wife because this is exactly the kind of game she likes. She loves the little, quick little pattern games on her phone. And this is Light Blue. It's a great application from Light Blue Software for managing a photography business. It's interesting, we have another one that I don't think is in the showcase, ProSelect, which is the other side of the photography business. So this is the, like the business side, and ProSelect is for like the photographer working with the client directly on you know, what pictures they're gonna use and all that stuff. So it's interesting, we have a couple of really good photography apps. This is uh, Pergamon Mystic from Esoferic. Uh, it's a web app for uh, library and resource management for primary and secondary education. I love this because it's a great example of what you can do in a web app. It's a super nice interface. But my favorite, <laughs> my favorite app written in Zojo, other than Zojo itself, my favorite app is called RealCAD. This is a desktop app from Eric Pousset. Uh, it's a very sophisticated, very full-featured CAD package. I mean, he literally says, if you don't like AutoCAD, you should consider RealCAD. So that, that's how full-featured this is. Um, Eric has been a user since 1998, <clears throat> and he shipped the first version of this in 2000, and he's been working on it ever since. Very, very sophisticated. Uh, I've seen pictures of things that were designed in RealCAD and then you know, actually created. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. And although the, his other app is not in our uh, Made with Zojo showcase, he also makes this one. This is called uh, iPocket Draw. It's a scaled down CAD package for iPhone and iPad. Imagine doing CAD on your iPhone. It's kind of interesting. Um, but it, it, it's fairly full featured. And I was talking to Eric recently about you know, his products. And he said, I'm not a professional developer. I don't even work on software full time. And that's kind of amazing for somebody that just works on software part time and doesn't even think of themselves. As a, as a professional developer, but we see this a lot. I mean, you guys share the stuff you're doing, and, and some of you are, do it full-time, some don't, but the software is always amazing, and the diversity of applications and solutions you guys create uh, is, is phenomenal. We, we love seeing it. It's one of my favorite things about doing what we do is seeing all the different things that you guys create. So we've been um, participating in GitHub's student developer program for a while now, a couple of years. 
this provides registered students with over 100, access to over 100 uh, developer tools, productivity apps, services, et cetera. And in fact, there have now been more than 3,000 student developers that have created Zojo accounts so they can get a free Zojo desktop license. So it's good to see uh, young people joining the Zojo community. And in fact, that's had a um, effect on our demographics. So back in 2017, this is what our demographics looked like. The 25 to 34 year old group was the largest and uh, the rest of it kind of looks as you'd expect. But now, over the years, it's changed. So we have many more young people and the graphic, you know, the demographics look pretty much as you'd expect them to look now. It's also changed in terms of gender. Now, 10 years ago, only 15% of our users were women. But today, that number has grown to 34%, more than doubled, and it's well above the industry average for programmers of 28%. So we have a much more diverse uh, group there as well. Our YouTube channel now has over 500 videos, and it has over a million views. And we've got some great user channels as well. Um, Gary Pettit, Brian Minnick, Eugene Dakin, Christian, and uh, Mohammed Braham. Uh, they all have channels on YouTube with videos, and we really appreciate their efforts to bring more content. If you've got ideas for things, and you know, it's, it's easy to record something and put it up on YouTube, I find that as developers, we tend to think that you know, there's some technique we've figured out or something we know, and it must be that everybody knows it. And we just assume that everyone knows this already. But chances are they don't. So it's record it, put it up on YouTube, that way you know, other people can benefit from it. Now we have a user uh, who's doing something interesting. Uh, John Ballesteri, he's a longtime Zojo user, and he's been building a very cool iOS app, and what he's doing that's different is that each day he's posting on Twitter uh, little videos, uh, talking about features he's developing, and then getting feedback. Uh, on that from the community, from his users and things like that. So you can kind of follow his development every single day of this app that he's building, which I think was kind of a novel idea. Um, it's also interesting because he told me that when he gets negative feedback, that that's really good. And when he gets positive feedback, that's pretty good too. He said the problem is when he gets no feedback. That's when he's not really sure <laughs> what's going on. So that's kind of how he judges his progress, you know, positive, negative, and no feedback at all. So the app he's building, is it's a simple app, it's called Photo Plus Tape, and it's basically for creating photo collages. So I've got a, a little video here, it's a very short video. So you can see, you pick some pictures from your photo library, and then it presents them, and you can rearrange them, and you can crop them, and what you ultimately end up with is a collage photo. But what I love is he puts little pieces of tape, transparent tape, between the, the photos, and I think what he told me was the plan was is that he was going to give the app away for free, but if you wanted to remove the tape, that was going to be the, the upcharge. Yeah, I thought that was very clever. So that's photo plus tape. Yeah, uh, yeah I would leave the tape. I, I think the tape is very cute. Anyway, so let's talk about the forum. The forum continues to be a popular place for us to all converse. It's great to have that. Uh, we've got over 20,000 members on the forum now. Uh, over 72,000 topics, which is amazing, and over 600,000 posts. Um, so it's, it's great to have so many people contributing, um, and I want to thank our forum moderators. Um, to me, the quality of being on a, on a public space on the internet is a direct result of moderation. If you have lots of moderation, it's going to be a pleasant place. If you have no moderation, you're going to have the reverse of that. So as much as, you know, if you if you ever have to deal with a moderator, that may feel maybe a little uncomfortable, but it's what keeps the uh, forum a wonderful place for us to all get together. And I really want to thank the forum moderators because that's a hard job to do, and they really do a great job. Uh, we don't have to do a lot of moderation, but having them there really, really helps. So what are people searching for on the forum? This is kind of interesting. So our top uh, trending search terms. First is JSON, that's not too surprising. In the silver position is Einhugger order latest. Uh, if anyone knows what that means, I mean, I know who Einhugger is, but 
order latest, I wasn't really sure, but that's a number two search term. And the number one search term will be of no surprise to anyone, and that's Android. So those are our top trending search terms year to date, so for, for 2022. Now, I looked at some other statistics on the forum, which are kind of interesting. I thought it would be nice to share a few notable ones. Now, keep in mind, we excluded any members of the Zojo team, so these are just uh, users. So first, most posts read. So the, in the bronze position, Beatrix Willius. In the silver position, Anthony Cyphers. And in the gold position, David Cox. Now, I do want to give an honorable mention because the person who was actually in the number one position was Jason Parsley. I wish he was here because <laughs> I hadn't told him that yet. Uh, but I really appreciate the fact that he's reading more posts than anybody because the job he does is support. So that's really, really great. Most time spent reading posts. So we've got Alberto D in number three and Anthony Cyphers again. Anthony spends a lot of time on the forum. You guys know that, though, I'm sure. And then Rick A is in the number one position. And if you don't recognize Rick A, uh, that's his chosen forum avatar. So, yeah, see, now you know who he is, right? <laughs> okay. All right, so most active users. We have uh, Dirk J, and then Beatrix Willius, and, no surprise, Anthony Cyphers. He's very, very active on the forum. I've, I've already said that. Now, this is an interesting category, most likes. Who gets the most likes? Well, first is Anthony. I, I actually expected him to be in the number one position, but he's not. Second is Christian Schmidt. Yeah, congratulations, Christian. And the user with the number one likes is Tim Parnell, number one. There you go. Now, there's another category, though, in our forum software, and that's highest quality users. Now, what does that mean? Because how can the forum software know, you know, how nice a person you are or something like that? Well, what they say is this is based on post score calculated using reply count, likes, incoming links, bookmarks, time spent, and read count. So it's a whole bunch of uh, statistics put together. So we have uh, Julia in the number three position, Tom McGrath in the number two position, and Gary Pettit in the number one position. So overall quality, Gary is the winner. So if he was here, I'd uh, give him an award or something. But anyway, so those are some interesting statistics from the forum. Okay, so I wanna talk about design strategy a little bit. Um, we have one, and you should have one too. Um, you probably do, whether you, whether you do this formally or, for, formally or informally, right? You need to have a design strategy. I'm bringing this up because uh, sometimes we run into users that think we don't have one, <laughs> and we, we definitely do. So what is that all about? Well, software is all about removing pain points, right? Uh, it's something that the user can't do, or it takes them a long time to do it, so it causes pain. And, our job as software developers is to remove that pain. And the feedback that you, or the pain, is often in three different, um, there's three different types. First of all, it's a pain point that the user can express, meaning they are aware of it and hopefully they communicate it to you. Hey, this isn't working. Or hey, I can't do X, right? Next is a solution that the user can express to you, where they, they come to you and say, here's, how, here's what I want to be able to do. Not in the form of a problem, but in the form of the solution to the problem. Now that's also useful, but what we tend to try to do, and I recommend this to you as well, is to find out what problem they're trying to solve. Because the best solution may not be the one they're, they're suggesting. And last but not least is the unexpressed problem. And this is where we as software developers have to be the, our, at our most creative. These are problems where the user doesn't even know they have this problem, right? Or they're just not expressing it because they think it's impossible, right? Uh, the best example for me of this is when, <clears throat> when I thought about the idea of users being able to build web apps using the same 
uh, skills and language that they were used to using. You know, I went to our bug base and no one had asked for that. There wasn't a single feature request for being able to build web apps. I presume it was because it just didn't seem possible to do it, right? But I knew it would be useful, and obviously it is. You know, more than half of our users, I think, now build web apps. So that's where we have to be most creative as software developers, is looking for the unexpressed pain that a user has. Once you've figured that out, you've got to find the best solution. And, you know, there's obviously, you know, in many cases, many solutions, they range in cost and time and all of that. So you have to figure out all that. And then you have to consider complexity. <clears throat> this is one of the things that we focus a lot on. Um, every time you add a feature to your software, whether it's us adding it to Zojo, you adding it to your applications, every feature makes your software more complex, right? And that means it's more for you to maintain and it potentially makes the, the software less uh, intuitive and friendly for your users. So it's something you really have to think about. This is my favorite quote from Steve Jobs. Basically, he's saying, I'm more proud of the things we didn't put into our software than the things that we did. Because that's a lot harder. You know, we all have you know, a thousand things we'd like to do, right? And it's picking the most important out of all of that. And, and saying no to everything else, at least for now, right? Uh, that's the more difficult job. But that's how you build software that's truly great. That's how you build software that's you know, intuitive and easy and reliable. You know, that, that's how you do it. Um, and if you do that right, then you end up with software that, uh, where your users are not gonna run out of runway. That, that's the expression I like to use, right? They, they start using it and they continue to use it and they never outgrow it, right? Because you've got just the right set of features. Next, you have to prioritize. And this is really difficult too. Um, none of us have unlimited resources, right? So you have to put things in order. We were just doing some of this over the last two days in our engineering meetings prior to the conference. So the key here is to optimize around impact. And I, I talked about this earlier for the bug bash. Um, we tend to focus on the upper right quadrant, uh, doing those first, and, but where you go from there, it's kind of debatable which quadrant you go to next. It could be the upper left, it could be the lower right, um, and there are reasons for both. Um, and then there's, of course, the, the bug that's in the lower left qu quadrant that you know will take you five minutes to fix, right? So we don't stick to this, you know, uh, sort of statically. You, know, it, you have to be willing to move around a bit. So that's our overall design strategy. It's, it's not complicated. Uh, it's not a strict thing. It's, it's a strategy. You know, the tactics may change. We may, you know, be a little flexible with it. But overall, that's how we do it. And we've been doing this for 24 years. Uh, we're not perfect at it. You know, we just keep getting better and better every year um, and learning and improving. And that leads into our vision for Zojo, which you know, continues to be what we've always wanted it to be, and that is an easy and fast way to build applications for the important platforms. And that started in 1998 with version one, believe it or not, that's what version one looked like. And at that time, we only built Mac desktop apps for 68K and PowerPC processors. We don't even support either of those processors today. That's how long we've been doing this. And it remains the same today, where we are building native applications for all three desktop operating systems, for the web, and for uh, both mobile operating systems. And we're now building for processors we didn't support back then, right? x86 and ARM. Um, in software development, I know you guys know this, you, you just have to keep pushing forward. You know, if you're not moving forward, you're stagnating, and in technology, the, tech, the world of technology is going to continue to move forward no matter what. So in order for you to go along with it, you just have to keep, keep pushing forward. All right, so that leads me to our roadmap. I wanted to talk about uh, some things that we're working on. It's changed a little bit um, since the roadmap that you've seen on, in the documentation, if you look up roadmap. 
Uh, and some of the things I'm talking about will be, or all the things, will be on the roadmap for R3, so they're not there, there right now. All right, so ARM64 for Linux. So we've actually, uh, our feature complete on this at this point. So we're just fixing bugs. Uh, so this will allow you to run on like Raspberry 64-bit Raspberry Pi, for example. So that's ARM64 for Linux. Android, as I said earlier, uh, we're feature complete now for Android for the first release. We're just fixing bugs, so Android's looking really, really good. We're gonna be adding some new UI controls. Now remember, these are roadmap. We're not talking about what release or when, right? These are just to give you an idea of things we're focusing on. We're adding some new UI controls. Uh, we're gonna add the popover control. I'm showing this on the Mac, but we're gonna be adding it to all the platforms that support popovers. We'll be adding a sidebar control. Again, this is a Mac screenshot, but Windows has a sidebar. I, I think Linux has one as well. So um, we'll be adding it to all the, the platforms. And the toolbars that you guys create in your apps now are native toolbars, but they're using older APIs. So they don't look quite as new and modern. So we're going to be modernizing the APIs under the hood. The API you use should stay the same, but you'll get more modern looking toolbars on all platforms. And for Windows 10 and 11, we're gonna be refreshing all the controls so you get modern looking appropriate controls for Windows 10 and 11. Make your interfaces look the best that they can. Now at the last conference, I showed some uh, ideas we had for changing uh, IDE navigation. And desktop user interfaces have evolved since then. Our thinking about this has evolved. Uh, so we're still working on this. And we have a lot of ideas that will be rolling out a bit at a time. So you'll start to see things like, for example, we plan to use popovers and sidebars and update the toolbar. You'll see all that stuff start to appear over time once we make it available to you. If you haven't seen this pattern, basically, uh, when we make some control or class available to you first in the framework, and then in a subsequent release, we start using it in the IDE. So that's generally how we do it. We're gonna be adding a new database class. It's called a database connection. And this is basically a class that appears as a singleton in the, uh, in the project. And you can configure it right in the IDE and have it point to uh, three different servers, for example, or three different SQLite databases. You can have uh, your testing or your development database, your testing database, and your production database, right? And then this becomes your connection to your databases. And this is just the very first step towards a vision of making the typical database activities you need to do be either low code or no code at all. You know, inserting records, deleting, doing queries, that sort of thing. But we're starting with the connection and then we'll be adding, you'll see more and more things show up on the roadmap related to databases as we go along. So in years past, we've talked about something called interops and this is a way of dealing with declares. And over time, our thinking about this has changed. We actually got interops working for iOS, but as we looked at it more, we actually decided that we had a much better way uh, to give you an easy way to work with declares, and we call it declare automation. And if you can imagine, this is basically where you can go to the, you know, your OS documentation and copy a declare, and uh, Zojo will create a Zojo method that interacts with that declare. So it kind of, shields you from having to deal with the OS specifics, which is what our framework does, right? So this is kind of extending that idea to you. So we think it'll make it easier for more people to work with declares. Now, initially this will be supported for iOS and Mac OS, but we will then after that be extending it to more uh, platforms. Now we've talked about the idea of building plugins for Zojo in Zojo and over the past three years, our thinking on this has changed just a little bit. So we're now calling this libraries. These are packages of Zojo code uh, that you can easily reuse and distribute. Uh, the source code, there's no access to source code in these libraries, right? So you're, you're making them to, for distribution. They can include classes, modules, controls, basically anything you can do in Zojo. And you can include your code across all platforms. 
So imagine you're creating some control and you want to have a version for iOS and Android and Mac and Windows and Linux and the web. You can do all of that in a single library and provide that. And you can make it separate libraries if you want, but you could do a single library. And these are also great for uh, if you have code that you share amongst you know, your projects. Um, you know, you can share code now, but you're kind of sharing it live, right? And that means if you change it in one project, you're changing it in others. And that's not a great idea, because you maybe not, you don't know what impact that's going to have. So a much better idea would be to take the shared code, compile it as a library, and then use the library across your different projects, because then you're in control of which version of that code is getting updated you know, as you go through all your projects. It's a much better idea. So anyway, so it's basically the same idea behind plugins, but we're calling it libraries because we think that's a more appropriate name. So, Grid control. Boy, this is, I think, the number one thing we get asked about. Do you guys have a grid control, right? Um, so we've actually been doing a lot of work on this, Javier, in the back there is, so you can pepper him with questions afterwards about a grid control. This is basically a flexible, gri uh, a flexible grid of container controls. That, that's really what it is, right? So anything that's a container control can be in a, a cell. And <clears throat> I've actually got a little video here, a quick little demo, so you can see what this does. So you've got rows and columns of containers. Um, you can have row headers, column headers, and you'll see in a minute, you can you know, select and deselect rows, columns, individual cells. Uh, you can obviously interact with each cell separately. Um, you can delete cells, delete columns, delete rows. Yeah, there is selecting. You can select rows and columns, select, deselect individual cells. And you'll see in a minute that we'll delete some columns. And you can have every cell can have a different container. So this is showing the same container, but you can have a different container in every cell. In fact, right at the end, you'll see we'll have a, a row at the bottom with a different set of containers. <coughs> you can change the background color, too. Now, this is at the prototype stage. <coughs> so we're continuing to work on it. But you can see we've done a lot. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, it's just deleting the cells. So there's much more to do on this, um, but it's looking pretty good. And this will let you do things that you really can't do with a list box. I mean, the list box is a great control. Everybody uses it. But this is going to give you the ability to, to do much, much more than that. So, so that's the grid control. So. A lot has been going on over the last three plus years, um, as you can see. And we've got a lot coming on our roadmap. These are just the big ticket items. There's obviously a lot more of the small features that we're going to be doing. But this is all part of our vision to continue making Zojo uh, easy, fast, and powerful. And <clears throat> in software, you know, it's, uh, it's easy to take the the position of, well, I'm going to make my software really intuitive and easy, but that means I have to give up power. Or I'm going to make it really powerful, but it won't be easy or intuitive. I, I don't think you have to make that trade-off. If you decide that you're going to make your software easy and powerful, you can do that. It's not easy to do that, right? That, that's the hard job, but that's what we're all getting paid to do, right? So I really believe that that should always be the vision for software. So. We have uh, about 10 minutes, I think, for questions. So anyone have a question? Yeah. Yeah, do we have anything anticipated regarding PDF editing? Um, that's a good question. You should ask Javier that question afterwards. Because he's, yeah, put up your hand, Javier, because yeah, he's doing all the PDF stuff. Thanks. So yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, so um, that's interesting. So it obviously depends on the size of that team. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, one person or a hundred people. Um, and the other part of it is, is that 
not, I mean, engineers don't want to fix bugs all the time, right? So you guys are all engineers, you know this. I mean, it's great to fix bugs, that makes people happy, but you want to also uh, develop features. So it's, it's always a um, balancing act that we have to do. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it, I mean, it's a big investment because our, our single biggest cost as a company is payroll, as is most companies. So, yeah. So I, we could talk about it, but, you know, I couldn't well, put it. Like that That's a good question. Yeah. I mean, obviously, selling more means more revenue and means more, like any company. So, yeah. We, I th we actually do that. I believe some users pay for a year at a time. So we don't put that on the website because most people are fine just paying month to month. But if you want to pay for a Zojo Cloud server, you know, if your accounting department, for example, requires that you just do it once a year, uh, you know, talk to customer service and we can get that set up for you. Um, yeah. What are, what are the traffic? It, we do. I don't have a slide for that. Uh, we're used in just about every country. Um, and I haven't checked it lately, but when I checked this years ago, I was curious as to which country we had the most users per capita, right? And I figured it'd be the United States or somewhere in Europe, you know, some big country. No, it's New Zealand. We have more users per capita in New Zealand than any other country on Earth. Yeah, I, I, I can't explain why that is. Um, I should ask Wayne, because Wayne Golding, our MVP, is in New Zealand. Could be, could be. So, oh, that's true. We do have users in Antarctica as well. Yeah, on every continent. The, the sun never sets on the Zojo Empire. Yeah. Him. Yeah, no, they should give it a thumbs up. Yeah, so. Oh, and just to add, any bug that was nominated got an automatic thumbs up. Oh, that's right, yeah. Yeah, that's right, Zojobot took care of that. I'm sorry, yeah, that's exactly right, so. Uh, well, when we, each cycle, we're going to spend that two weeks, and so we'll be looking at those. So, yes, yes. In the back. Maybe. <laughs> Yeah, if it's, if it's not on the road, we think about a lot of things. The list of things we want to do in Zojo is very, very long. We're, we're never going to be twiddling our thumbs. But what we put on the roadmap are things that we see coming in the near term, right, in the not too distant future. Um, and as you guys know, the order is the approximate order that we're, we believe we're going to deliver them in. Some will be delivered in the same release, some will not. That doesn't mean different releases. Um, but that's, uh, you know, we use it, so that's definitely something we're, we're thinking about. Um, yeah? I was looking at the iOS versus Android, and I noted that you have to have a Mac to compile on iOS. Um, have you considered the possibility of perhaps like a workaround for the API where the project is loaded on Zojo's Mac to be compiled? Yeah, we've thought about that. I don't know if we want to get into that business or not. I, I wish that Apple would let you, you know, run the simulator on things other than Macs. That, that, they're, they're the ones that have that limitation. Um, but, um, you know, yeah, so. Is there another, oh yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, so Apple has made it possible to take a iOS or, or an iPad app and make sort of a desktop version of it. Um, 
I think it remains to be seen how successful that's actually going to be. I don't think that's Apple's long-term strategy. I think that's, they, they, have, they brought a lot of developers in uh, with iOS, and, they, and those people are building apps exclusively, and they want to be able to build desktop apps, and they want to make that process as easy as possible. For me, when I'm, you know, the apps that are available for iOS that also run on the desktop, they feel like desk accessories, if you remember that from classic Mac OS. They don't feel like full-fledged apps. Now, if Apple decides that that's the way they're going to go, obviously we will transition. But it doesn't feel at this point like that's Apple's plan. It's, it's really just a way for them to get more apps on the Mac um, that are coming from you know, this enormous catalog of iOS and iPad apps. So we'll see. Yeah. Sure. Um, are you all concerned some sort of a market risk or program that's coming in the near future that will use it to get your apps on the screen and the windows and Mac will kind of hover on your desktop? Yeah, so in terms of, of getting your apps into the various stores, we are looking at the technical side of that. Right, the, the things you need to do that we could make easier uh, you know, on the technical side. Now, on the marketing side, well, you'd have to ask Dana about that, uh, but, <laughs> but in terms of marketing your products better. But if you mean by marketing just having them in the stores, then yeah, we, we recognize that you know, with, with the app stores these days, there's extra steps that you have to go to, to to get your products in there. And there are things on the technical side that we could be doing that could be more automatic. And we're... Those are definitely things on our list. We don't have them on the roadmap because they're not quite roadmap type of things, but they're definitely uh, features that we're looking at. So uh, I got time for maybe one or two more questions. Anybody? Yeah. The, for me, one of the most interesting things you mentioned was the library versus developing courses. And right. I think that's uh, a really great step that you've taken. Um, how soon will <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> yeah. so, so all I can say is when, you, when we update the roadmap, you'll see where it is on the roadmap. Um, you know, in years past, we would uh, naively and optimistically say, oh, that feature will be available in this release, and that feature will be available in this release. And if the world had just come to a stop when we said that, our, our estimates probably would have been pretty accurate. But what ends up happening is, you know, Microsoft changes something about Windows. Apple adds Apple Silicon support. The world doesn't stop. And so all these new things show up, and we have to react to them. And that kind of interferes with our planning. So we've learned, you know, uh, trial by fire. <laughs> uh, don't say anything about releases or dates. As fun as it is to say that, I love to stand up here and say, in the next release, we're going to have, but uh, it doesn't always work out that way. And, and anyone that's ever talked to me about happiness will hear my lecture about how happiness is all about managing expectations. So if you want to be happy, manage other people's expectations of you, right? So you all want to be happy, right? <laughs> so I'm going to manage your expectations. Yeah. We're, yeah, so, so there, yeah, there won't, I was very careful with how I worded that. There, there won't be any access to the source code. Whether it will be compiled to LVM bit code or whether it will be encrypted in some way cryptographically, right? Not like what we had before where it was a password and if you were clever enough you could figure it out, right? Uh, it won't be like that. So, but your source code will be completely protected one way or the other. Uh, a library. I don't want to say the word DLL because well, these are for life, yeah. These are for Zojo. I want to make that very clear. You're not going to be building libraries for Photoshop, right? They're for Zojo. Right. 
Yeah, and, and you know, it's not a lot different than what we were talking about, but plugin, that word often, not in Zodra necessarily, but that word often means something that adds a new function to the product that the plugin is for. And libraries are more extra functionality that the, that the application will use internally, right? So we just thought that was a better name for this. Christian? That'd be a great idea. Yeah, no, we we definitely, yeah, we, we well, yeah, it, but we had, it kind of worked during a beta and it, it didn't work out, so we, 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 we took it out. But we do want to make Zojo, as the Zojo IDE, uh, work better with version control. Uh, I'll just say that as a sort of overall thing. We, we absolutely realize a lot of you use it. We want to make it easy for people that have never used version control as well. So we've got some steps that we're planning to do in that regard. Uh, Bart. It seems that because of my day job, I'm more impacted by marketing, and it seems that there's a, a lot, a large movement towards this low code type of, it seems to me this whole idea of the library is managed and handled properly and more brought up and marketed. That would put Jojo, the Zojo at the, at the forefront. Of yeah, so, um, long ago, in the early days of Visual Basic, they made it possible for you to build ActiveX controls using Visual Basic itself, right? Before it was, you had to use Visual C and all that stuff, but now you can use Visual Basic. And their third-party market just grew like crazy because the average user could now take stuff they had, package it up, and make it available for sale, right? So we're definitely, considering that aspect of <laughs> it, yeah. Okay, I'm out of time, so um, I'll be around, obviously, for the next two days, and I really appreciate you guys coming. I, you know, this is the first event after the pandemic, which is now winding down, thankfully, and I, but still, I appreciate everybody, you know, coming here, braving uh, the airports and all that stuff, you know, so, or driving, and uh, a long way. Tim drove quite a ways as well. So anyway, thank you very much, and um, yeah, let's move on. <laughs>